It's 1992. Bill Clinton is elected president. The Summer Olympics are held in Barcelona with baseball and badminton officially added to the list of sports. That was about time. The silence of the lambs dominates the Oscars, winning the Big Five Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, Best Actor and Best Screenplay. This is a car show, but here's my bonus advice for you. You should go watch this movie. It's very good. Horst Seehofer tells us his joke of the year. Herr Pfarrer, muss ich jetzt beichten, dass ich Zahnarzt bin? Worauf der Pfarrer antwortet, beichten müssen sie es nicht, aber bereuen sollten sie es schon. <laughs> And uh, the ordinary bat is the animal of the year. This would have been a much closer race in 2020, I guess. But what happened to the automotive industry and which cars of that year swept the board just like that little cheeky bat in Hannibal Lecter? Let's go right back and find out. Welcome to Car Crush. The world's automotive industry finds itself in the midst of a period of fundamental structural change. There's a growing demand of society for protection of the environment and improved vehicle safety. As a consequence, the complexity for the development and production of a vehicle is growing rapidly. The internationalization of markets, which we've seen in the years before, is now being followed by a similar internationalization of production and procurement. In 1992, the automotive industry continues to be locked into recession. Global production of passenger cars remains on a disappointing level, with 35.4 million produced. The main reason for the continued low level of demand was the poor economic situation in many parts of Western Europe and in Japan. In the US, on the other hand, after months of recession, we see a slight recovery over the year. Their modernized products are beginning to become more popular on the home market. We call it cab forward. What we did was move the windshield forward. Then we pulled the rear wheels back, made the rear doors wider, the Japanese automobile industry continues to be very expansive. It was declared a national strategic industry by the government. Practically all the Japanese manufacturers set up production facilities in US or Canada. The Japanese automobile industry's share of world production has risen to 34%. Today we're somewhere around 10%. So Japan was really the China of the 90s, extremely successful. And there's another future automotive giant starting to appear just around the corner. The South Korean manufacturers are ready to expand their global position with Hyundai, Daewoo and Kia. What else? Renault ended production of one of the world's longest running cars, the R4, after 31 years in production. Nigel Mansell won the Drivers' Championship with Williams and the Volkswagen Golf Mark III is the car of the year. But now let's have a closer look at some of the most exciting introductions of the year to track down the future classics. I'd like to start by mentioning two new and very famous cars of the year just to make the picture complete. The Ferrari 456 and the McLaren F1. Two fantastic cars of course, not even future classics but classics already. They were instant classics when they came out. But I'm trying to avoid presenting cars that probably 99% of us can't afford. There's so many supercar channels out there and it's always fun to watch. But I would like to focus on cars that we could all go out and buy if we wanted. And I'm convinced you can have the joy of a 456 in a car that costs less than 5% of it. Actually, let's run a professional internet search and verify that. All right. The cheapest 456 is around 50,000 euros. Five percent is 2,500. That's the territory of a decent Mazda MX-5. Let's see. Now we could argue about the exact level of joy, but for the moment let's just make a cut here and acknowledge 
that there's great cars in all price categories. And our first contender for today is in the category very cheap, very affordable. And it's a bit of a strange contender for the title Future Classic. It's the Renault Twingo, presented at the Paris Motor Show, designed by the great Patrick Luquemont. This car was an instant sensation and a huge success. The name was a creation combining the dance stars Twist, Swing and Tango. I didn't know that, but it tells you a lot about its philosophy and character. This car is about happiness, joy of life, style, simplicity, uniqueness, Frenchness, like only a handful of cars before. And it's cleverly engineered. I think it's quite a masterpiece of small car design. The interior dimensions were better than in any car of that size. It always had the reputation of being a women's car, but you know what? I know a man, a grown-up man, driving to his workplace every day in a first-generation Renault Twingo. And I think, honestly, there's something very masculine about that. I'm very convinced that this car will have a place in the list of the great French compact cars, like the R4, the R5, the Peugeot 205, the Citroën de Chevaux, and so on. But this little swinging Twingo is a future classic. And next is the Alfa Romeo 155. Great brand, of course, but always a bit struggling with the reality check. This model is based on the Fiat Tipo, front wheel drive of course, looks like a Volkswagen Jetta or Vento or something. The spoilers on many cars don't make anything better. Quality is not good either. Well, that being the case for many Alphas, but then at least they should look pretty. In my opinion, there's not very much to like about this car. That 155 on the other hand is absolutely brilliant. Let's move on. Talking about boring saloon cars with famous race siblings. Let's start the other way around. Here's a look at the Impreza WRX. And of course it's brilliant and everybody loves it. But this? Not so much. Let's move on. But let's stick to Japanese cars for a moment. And here's a particularly exciting one. The Mazda RX-7. In my opinion, Mazda, just like Honda, is one of these strange brands which are able to build some of the most desirable cars ever made at the same time as some of the most boring cars ever made. I mean, how can you build this and that at the same time, from the same company, with the same people? Or this and that? Of course, there are plenty of companies building boring cars, that's no news. But then they are building one boring car after another. They usually don't build an RX-7 in between. But it's good to have it here, so let's have a look. This generation started in 1992, obviously, and is called the FD. It features a twin-turbo, one rotary engine, but more importantly, an absolutely gorgeous exterior. It's simple, it's pure, it's slim and very Japanese. You have to love the low bonnet, the balanced proportions and the iconic rear lamps. Many of you might also know this car from various video games like Gran Turismo, which massively helped building its reputation. Unfortunately, that's also the only occasion I was driving an RX-7, which is a huge shame. So if you own one and you want to do me a favor, just write me a message and we'll make an episode just to honor this RX-7. It's arguably one of the greatest Japanese cars ever made. Do marigato. This is a future classic. And next, back to Europe. The Mercedes-Benz S-Class Coupe C140. And I have to say, I've always been struggling with this car and I don't really understand why. I love Mercedes. I like the style of the 90s. I like two-door cars. I prefer coupes over convertibles. And I even love the sedan, the W140. You've seen it in my last video. But I never really liked this one. In my opinion, the front lacks a certain seriousness. It's almost cute. The headlamps are too big, too high. The proportions in a side view are a bit lame for a coupe. The doors are too short. Bed line is too low. I'm probably on the wrong side with this opinion. Bruno Sacco says it was one of his most beautiful designs. And then it's getting really hard to argue. But I'm just giving you my personal thoughts. 
I think the W140 is much more balanced. An R129 is more precise. The C124 is more elegant. And so on. For me, every S-Class Coupe before this one was better, and every S-Class Coupe after this one was better as well. Tell me what you think, maybe you can help me. But nevertheless, it's a luxury two-door Mercedes of undisputed quality. Only 26,000 were built over seven years. It offers great comfort and luxury in technology. By the way, this was the first Mercedes ever to offer radio as standard. Let's just hope that it grows over time and turn a blind eye to it when saying this Mercedes S-Class Coupe is a future classic. And to give you a bit of solace at the end, here's a video from an early design model. It could have been much, much, much worse. And now let's head to the yes. Two exciting cars of that year. First one is the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Iconic design, very authentic, very American, unlike most of the generations that followed. Obviously, it doesn't have quite the style of an XJ Cherokee, which is just gorgeous. But maybe it gets there one day in the future. It was an extremely successful car, one of the most widely loved off-roaders slash SUVs. And this was not one of these modern era boulevard SUVs, which never saw gravel. This Jeep was used and abused over the years. And thus it can be hard to find cars in good condition. It's robust, it has character, it's a very capable off-road. It's an honest car, and in my opinion, this Grand Cherokee is a future classic. And next, the Dodge Viper. Okay, that's something special at first sight. It's one of these larger-than-life icons of the US automotive industry. The very first generation Dodge Viper is dubbed the SR1 and was presented as a concept car at the North American International Auto Show already in 1989. Reactions were so positive that Chrysler decided to bring it to production and create one of the most ludicrous automobiles to ever see the light of day. There were almost no changes between concept and production car and this thing had a presence unlike any other. It was so badass absurd, it was the perfect poster car of the 90s. And its technology matched the looks. It had an in-your-face 8-liter V10, based on a truck engine and tweaked by Lamborghini. They were part of Chrysler back then. There were no driving aids whatsoever, not even ABS. The side windows were made from vinyl and just zipped in place. Transmission was a 6-speed manual gearbox. This car was as raw as it gets. There was a bit more comfort added in 1996 with a major facelift and the introduction of the beautiful coupe version called GTS. As useless and unnecessary and out of place it may be, I love this Dodge Viper and I think it's a future classic. So that was about it for the year 1992. Next week we're going to talk about Nelson Mandela, one ridiculously clever car and stones. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.